Good evening and welcome to Phil Hardberger Park, the Urban Ecology Center. Luckily, they picked the one air-conditioned part of Hardberger Park for tonight's mayoral debate between Greg Brockhouse and Ron Nuremberg. And I want to thank this huge crowd that's with us. You guys can round of applause, let everybody know you're here. This is the third debate between Mr. Brockhouse and Mr. Nuremberg. We are carrying it live on KSAT.com and KSAT TV on your streaming devices. And we want to thank you all for joining us at home as well. We also want to thank the Northside Neighborhoods for Organized Development for putting this debate together and asking KSAT to be a part of it. And so with that in mind, I want to introduce a member of that organization who's going to go through the ground rules for this event and how these two candidates were picked. Join me in welcoming to the podium, Colleen Wagaspak. Thank you. Thank you. I see a lot of familiar faces and, and some new ones. So um, I wanted to tell you, well, first may I ask if you will silence your phones so they won't, we won't be interrupted. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about who Northside Neighborhoods for Organized Development is. You might hear us go by the name NOD, N-N-O-D. Um, our mission is to enhance and protect the quality of life for neighborhoods and residents. We inform residents of issues affecting them, and we work with governmental entities um, and agencies and local businesses to represent neighborhood interests. Um, we, we have been, um, we have, Several of our members are active on boards or commissions with the city. Uh, we actively support uh, Phil Hardberger Park, the park system, and the Greenway Trail system. And um, we've successfully, successfully assisted member HOAs with planning and zoning issues and have successfully implemented deed restrictions on several properties that help protect those the neighborhoods around the properties. We meet on the f second Monday of each month at Phil Hardberger Park. We meet in the classroom. We unfortunately don't usually have this many <laughs> attendees, but um, we meet at 7 p.m. So you're welcome to join us any time. Um, and I, if, if you will pick up a flyer over there, it has our contact information on it. So we, we welcome you. Um, I also um, want to mention that these are just two of the nine candidates for mayor. There are some very worthy candidates in the interest of time. We were not able to accommodate everyone. If you think about, you know, a few minutes opening, a few minutes closing and all, we would have only gotten in two questions and we didn't feel that was meaningful enough. So we made the decision to narrow it down. Um, however, um, on the table over there, if you have not already picked up one, is a flyer that lists all of the candidates, and if we could find their contact information, um, we, we put it on there for you. I encourage you to contact those campaigns and talk to them more. As a matter of fact, I think we have a couple of candidates um, here tonight, and I encourage you to stop and speak to them and maybe ask them their views on some of the questions that, that are asked tonight. Uh, Mr. Bert Sicconi is here. Will you raise your hand, Mr. Sicconi? Thank you. And Mr. Matt Pena. It's, oh, okay. <laughs> but it, you see the people with the signs. I'm sure they'll be able to connect you with him. In fact, I think he just walked in the door. Mr. Matt Pena is here. Um, I, I, I encourage you to talk to um, either of those campaigns and reach out to any of the other candidates to find out more about what you need to know. Um, we weren't able to use every question that was presented to us, obviously, because we probably had close to 100 questions. So um, if, you, if your question is not presented tonight, I encourage you to, to contact all of the campaigns and get your answers directly from them. So. Uh, and lastly, I want to read the form procedures that NOD has established. We generally have uh, procedures, and they're pretty consistent from time to time, uh, just a little bit of wording changes. The purpose of this form is to allow voters to obtain information about two of the pr nine proposed mayor candidates in, candidates in order to make an informed decision. We ask that each of you listen to the information presented with an ear to better understanding the positions of these candidates and how they could effectively lead our city. We ask that all attendees take a seat, if we have enough, 
and remain respectable of the candidates and of your fellow attendees. Attendees who disrupt the meeting will be asked to leave the room. Out of courtesy to the candidates and fellow attendees, we ask that you refrain from talking during their comments. In the interest of time, we also ask that you not respond to speaker's comments or answers either verbally or by clapping. And you know, we're, we're not gonna, you know, occasional thing, we're not gonna knock you on the, on the knuckles or anything. <laughs> Signs and banners should, be, should not obstruct the view of other attendees. Each candidate will be allowed five minutes to inform attendees of their background and why they believe they are the best choice for mayor. Questions from voters have been submitted in advance, either by email or by completing a question card by 6.45 this evening. Questions have been reviewed, combined, and selected uh, for a good variety. Uh, questions will not be taken from the floor. Each candidate will be allowed uh, two minutes to present his answer, then the first candidate to respond will then have an additional minute. Obviously, you gentlemen do not have to take the full time, and less time you can get your point across in, the more questions we get in. So <laughs> uh, the candidates will alternate answering questions first. At the end of the question period, each candidate will be allowed three minutes for closing remarks. We thank you very much for coming tonight, and I'll turn it back over to Mr. Spreester. Thank you, Colleen. A round of applause for Nod and for all the hard work that they've done. And, and I will just add to that, and I'm sure this is no surprise to either of the candidates tonight, but as the moderator, I do have a wide discretion if I feel like something is brought up that needs to be answered uh, by either of the candidates. Uh, I have that discretion to go ahead and extend the window on those questions. But right now, let's get to it. I want to introduce the two men who want to be mayor of San Antonio. Please join me in welcoming to the podiums Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Councilman Greg Brockhaus. And through an agreement, yes, these two do agree on some things, <laughs> it was decided that Mayor Ron Nuremberg would go first with his five-minute introduction, followed by Councilman Brockhouse's five-minute introduction. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. And first, I, have to, I was informed, uh, Steve, that we need to say happy birthday, Steve Spreester. <laughs> My name is Ron Nuremberg. Uh, I am proud and honored to serve as your mayor. I was also proud to start in this neighborhood as part of the board of Northside Neighbors for Organized Development, where we worked and advocated for our communities for organized and quality growth for San Antonio, and also as your city councilman uh, for two terms in District 8. It is the high honor of my life to serve as your mayor in San Antonio. I ran for mayor two years ago, and you elected me mayor two years ago because I promise to, to create and build with you the city you deserve, and I'm delivering on that promise. We've restored our momentum. San Antonio is thriving. Our economy is booming. Over the last two years, we've created 40,000 jobs, most of those in high-wage high target sector jobs. We're at full employment. In fact, we have created jobs in target sectors so that San Antonio's economy is thriving, and people who want a job can find a job here in San Antonio. We've brought crime down over the last two years, from what was a 25-year high to now a 30-year low. And the most important concern that you have that we've heard all throughout this community, traffic congestion. We've made great progress. So over the last two years, we've doubled our commitment to road maintenance, basic street maintenance. We've prioritized the projects in the most congested areas. And we've launched Connect SA, the most innovative transportation plan the city has ever seen. I'm proud of the great strides that we've made. I'm proud of the success of San Antonio, but all that momentum and success is at risk if we don't stay the course. In fact, that means taking care of the million and a half people here who are here today, and it means planning for the million more people who will be here over the next 20 years. And I hope you will see, and we will see, that we, in, in this community, I'm the only candidate on this stage who has been planning and who has had a track record of proven success in this community. And that is a strong vision for the future, and that's why what is needed to ensure that San Antonio remains successful over the long haul. I hope you'll agree that we need to continue to keep our economy booming. 
We need to continue to stay vigilant on crime, and we need to also ensure that we forge ahead with innovative transportation solutions for our most tra pressing traffic problems. So I'm asking for your vote to continue working hard every single day to make San Antonio the city you deserve. Thank you very much. Councilman Brockhouse. Thank you. So uh, Ron did get in the shameless Priester plug. So I'm going to take the shameless Texas Tech University plug. Uh, I have a, uh, I have a, my 26-year-old daughter's up in her master's program right now at Texas Tech. So if they win, I told her, stay indoors. Uh, be careful running around the city. Who knows what's going to happen? But big shout out, of course, to the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Uh, let's hope they bring a national championship home to Texas. And we should be done. And I, hopefully Ron will agree with me on this one. I think we're going to agree again that we can finish up so we can get back in time uh, to catch the second half of that basketball game. So I am thrilled, uh, obviously, to be here today uh, to have a conversation with you about the future of our community, who we are and what we can be when we work together. And I continue to be thankful to Ron. Uh, that he stands with me next to me. We have this conversation. And you'll notice politics across our nation's gotten out of control. It's out, out of control in Austin. It's out of control in San Antonio. And the way we treat each other and how we go back and forth, it seems almost comical at times. I'll say one thing, Ron will say the other. And it goes back and forth. And it's hard to digest exactly where people are and where they stand. But the fact that Ron is here with me today and we're going to have this conversation, I continue to be appreciative of Ron Nuremberg and the things he does. He's an honorable man doing the best he can I just think I see my future in San Antonio, my family's future, and a different path, and we're going to talk about that tonight, but I do look forward to the conversation. I'm blessed to have my wife, Annalisa, here with me this evening, and our kids are at home and at school, and some of them are at uh, uh, Cub Scouts, and they're doing their thing right now because they're not going to sit through an hour and a half of Greg talking about uh, debate stuff, but uh, we're here tonight, again, uh, to be a part of this community. Uh, you, the North, the North Side Neighborhoods Organized for Development, thank you for putting this together. Thank you to KSAT, and I look forward to this great conversation. I've lived my entire life in San Antonio. Uh, I grew up on the South Side, moved up into the Valley High area, graduated from John Jay High School. I understand this community. I left and joined the United States Air Force and served 10 years on active duty, learning just about everything you can as a military member, someone who puts on that uniform, came back to San Antonio and moved off of 151. My mother said I'd never live further than five miles from her, and she was absolutely right. But when I joined the Air Force, I told her I was joining to go see the world, and it's the corniest joke of all time, but I literally, I just, I came back to SeaWorld. That's where I ended up. I've lived around <laughs> SeaWorld my entire life. I don't know what it is about the place, but uh, that's my community, and, and I'm, I'm thankful and blessed uh, to represent District 6 on the San Antonio City Council. And I'll push back a little bit on what the mayor said. We've had wild success in District 6 because we do something that's very important that's missing at City Hall. We think about neighborhoods first. All of our policy, the things we do in District 6, focuses on neighborhoods. I know all 40-plus of them. I know where the potholes are in the great Northwest. I know who's struggling and doesn't eat on Oklahoma Street on the west side. I understand old Highway 90. I live in the neighborhoods. So my track record of success may lie or be lacking in taking care of certain groups and special interest people, but I tell you where it's most important works at, that's taking care of residents, neighborhoods, and community members. And we knock that door every day. I got to tell you, 90% of the time I spend is in the community working hard, understanding residents, people, neighborhood associations, and the things that matter most. And that's what I want to do across our entire city. 240 plus neighborhoods, we need to get back to taking care and understanding and closing that gap between what City Hall does and what the neighborhoods do. That gap has grown over the years. Neighborhoods are left out and ignored. We have to change that and get back to basics at City Hall. And that's what I'm fighting for. And those back to basics are lower property taxes and fees. We're pricing people out of their home. It's crime. The mayor talked about the crime rate. I'm here to tell you the crime rate is the highest of the top 15 cities in the nation. It is decreasing. It is still number one. The mayor talks about jobs. We've had the worst job creation in the last 10 years. Did not create 40,000 jobs. We created 11,000 jobs. That is income and money and opportunity to the people in our neighborhoods and community. Then we got to get back to infrastructure, working hard on public safety, but most importantly, that trust gap between the two, city hall and community, I'm going to close that. And as mayor, I'm going to be there in each and every one of your neighborhoods, understanding what matters most to you, working with the council member to deliver those things that matter most. And this community, right, you understand it more than anybody because your investment, right, the property taxes, the things you pay are carrying this city. And we have to honor that and we have to work hard for you just as much in Hunter's stand as we do down on the west side. We've got to do everything that matters so that your voice is heard and it's the top of the list. I'm here to fight for the million and a half people who are here now. 
the million people are coming here, more power to them. But I got to take care of those who are here now and that's doing the job every day for you. I want to thank you for this. Ron, I continue to look forward to the opportunity to have a conversation, and let's get at it. Is there a rebuttal on the opening statement? No. <laughs> Sorry, no rebuttal on opening statements, but I mean, as something tells me we're going to get back yeah, okay. into some of the right. things that you want to talk about. On just about. about every topic that was yeah, discussed. Yeah. Sure, thank right. you. Let's start, though. I, w I will ask you the first question, um, and I, I want to I'm going to ask you the same question. So this, is this can either be a rebuttal or you can answer the question however you want to go. But, but Ron, I'll give you the first question, Mr. Mayor. You've been in public office. You've both been in public office. You both have accomplishments. Name one cornerstone of your record, one concrete thing you hang your hat on and say, this is why you should vote for me. Yeah, well, I think that uh, when it comes to, ba to basics budgeting, mm -hmm. to ensure that the essential services of our city are taken care of, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we, have we are a city that balances based on equity, meaning that we put our city investments, our public investments, in the places that it's needed the most. And that means the neighborhoods that Councilman Bronkhaus is saying are, are, are being left behind are finally getting addressed. And you're seeing that in the construction projects. If people are getting stopped in, it's because progress is happening. We have doubled the resources going into basic street maintenance and infrastructure for our community. We've dropped the crime rate. Councilman Brockhaus uh, is talking about the highest violent crime rate in the cities uh, in the country. That was true two years ago when I took office. We have since made the greatest turnaround in two years. And, and, anything, and, and saying otherwise is an affront to the truth, and it's an insult to the men and women who are on the front lines wearing the uniform who should be credited with that work. So we want to make sure that we have a city that takes care of the basics. That city is here today. It's because of strong leadership that are brought to the mayor's office. And Councilman Brockhouse may want to dance around and, and, and say that we should be embarrassed for that success. But I'm here to tell you that, that success in progress is because people are taking ownership of the real issues in our community today. And that stops, starts with leadership from the top. And the other thing is... We are taking care of the million and a half citizens who are here in our community today. But to ignore the million that are coming over the next 20 years is to ensure that all two and a half million of those people are not taken care of and that we, don't have, we are not prepared for the future. That's leadership that I'm providing. That's something I've demonstrated throughout my career. And that's something that is void in the office of Councilman Brockhouse. Great, well, Councilman Brockhouse. As you could tell, Ron gets angry when you disagree with him. And I get angry when you watch. lie. Hold on a second here. Nobody's lying, Ron. Hold on, Ron. You really need to dial it down a notch. What I'm trying to say is, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, in, the, I'm not in the mix cutting you off, sir. I sat there and listened to you. The least you could do is the same for me. I, the crime rate stats are from 2018. It wasn't from two years ago. That's verifiable. You can look it up. It's 100%. You can, you can Google it and find out. So that is solid. The other thing you need to think about here is I don't just because I disagree with Ron and his his programs and what he's trying to accomplish doesn't mean he's void of leadership or any accomplishment. I just consider our community going down a different path, period. So I'm not going to sit here and, and push back on everything he says, because at some point we have to talk about the ideas and what things look like going forward in the future. All right. Our accomplishment. The number one thing I'm most proud of is I don't stop fighting for neighborhoods, period. When we got elected, you know what I'm most proud of? We continued block walking. We didn't disappear from neighborhoods when we got elected and just come back when it was vote or election time. We kept doing what we call block walks. In fact, we got kind of comical with it. We called them Brock walks because we wanted to continue going into the neighborhoods. We did 73 of them over our two-year term. We knocked on doors, voter, non-voter, anybody that we can speak to to find out what mattered most neighborhood by neighborhood. So Ron doesn't understand what's happening in District 6 because he doesn't come to District 6. And that, that's okay. He's, he's, got, he's, he's busy. But I'm telling you, our record of accomplishment, what I hang my hat on is the fact, the hard work we've done with neighborhoods and uniting them. The District 6 neighborhoods are together and they work hard and they work strong together. That level of accomplishment permeates everything. You know where the co-compliance issues are. You understand where the crime issues are, where the mailbox theft pieces are. You know that because you're in the neighborhoods and that's the type of mayor I'm going to be. Again, we can disagree about the facts all day long and we'll go back and forth on it. Like I said, night and day, we're going to have this conversation. Ron's path I just think is wrong and that failed leadership is hurting all of us. The image we're sending across the nation is one that we've got to be concerned about with recent decisions and choices, and it's because of a lack of inclusion and not working with neighborhoods. Mayor Nurnberg. I do hope people Google the facts, because you will see that in 2018, the crime rate dropped by 18 percent. 
In 2017, the crime rate dropped by 17%. This has been the greatest turnaround. In fact, our crime rate is declining at two times the national average. And that credit is to the law enforcement, men and women in uniform, and the community working together. Those are the facts, and that is the truth. Let's move on to the next question. Because you talked about the future, Councilman Brockhouse. I want to I see what your vision is for the future. This is a question from the membership uh, and the crowd that we see here in front of us. What are the three most important issues San Antonio government is facing in the future? Three most important issues for the future. Well, I think the number one is the trust gap. I, and I think if elected mayor, and I'm blessed to get the job, I've got to close that. Like I talked about at the beginning, the gap between neighborhoods and city hall is as wide as it's ever been. The things that are cared about at city hall aren't the things that are cared about in neighborhoods. And the votes change, right? Those issues change at city hall almost every week. Right? We could be talking about property taxes, of which I've been an advocate and a fighter for. Property tax reduction. Two years in a row, I have voted to reduce the property tax rate. Ron Nuremberg has voted against that. He is not in favor of property tax relief. Two years in a row, we fought for a city homestead exemption because we don't have one in the state. Ron Nuremberg was against it. Property tax relief and fee reduction is huge, and it's huge across all residents and community members. It doesn't matter if you're living on the south side or if you're living up here. It doesn't make a difference. The rate of your property taxes are increasing. And by the way, you just received your bills, so I understand that. I know you're feeling it as well. So property taxes and fee reduction, and we have to go after crime. What the mayor's leaving out is I am endorsed by the police officers. You're not endorsed so, by the police officers. You're endorsed by the union political hacks. Okay, Ron, Ron, please allow me to finish. I am endorsed by the San Antonio police officers. That, that team, the whole family of police officers endorses me because I understand we're short over 180 police officers and have consistently been. And I understand that the crime rate is an issue. And it depends. It's different for every neighborhood. While here it may be mailbox theft in districts 8 and 9, it could be something completely different. It could be murders on the east side. It could be murders in district 6. We've had them. It could be car thefts, vehicle burglaries, all these things. Crime is different depending on which neighborhood you go to. We've got to be smart about it. We cannot have a reduced officer count. The mayor has voted against the police contract. So he is not a supporter of law enforcement. He stood on that. At the end of the day, I have the endorsement. I'm doing the best I can. So I feel those are the, the most important issues that we got to work on. Property tax relief, crime and public safety. And then we got to get back to wages and jobs. I think it's very important that the mayor claims that he's had the greatest uh, also increase in job creation over the last 10 years. He hasn't. It was the worst in the last 10 years. When he said he was going to create 70,000 jobs, he created All right, 11. Time's up. The record speaks for itself. Time's up. Thank you, Councilman. Mayor? So there's a lot in there I want to um, address. Uh, so you asked the question, what are our top three issues? I think we need to continue with our economy. We need to continue to grow and create jobs for our community as it continues to grow. We have to address traffic congestion, and that's why we're rolling out the transportation reform package that will go in front of voters <laughs> next year. And we have to continue our vigilance against crime. But to say that I don't respect law enforcement is just a, a ridiculous assertion. I respect them well enough to know and to give credit for a job well done. Now, with regard to property taxes, like you, I struggle with property taxes, too. In fact, my family's property taxes have gone up probably 50 percent over the last 10 years. I am the only person on the stage who actually has paid the property taxes he owes. And I'm the only one on the stage who has actually lowered your tax rate. What are we doing? We know we have to work collaboratively. So I'm working with state legislature, the governor's office, and the lieutenant governor to address real property tax reform, which we know will only come when the state fully addresses school finance reform. But that's not enough. We are working locally, too, to analyze a new city homestead exemption in addition to the senior freeze that's already available, as well as the, the state homestead exemption. And just last week, I led council on a vote to approve a top-down review of the Bear County appraisal district process so that the government is appraising pro your property for what it's worth, not what it thinks it needs. We are working on real property tax reform while Councilman Brockhouse is working on his sound bites. Councilman Brockhouse. Well, the sound bite is this. Ron Nuremberg voted against property tax relief two years in a row. That's about Not the true. simplest site. I'm sorry, Ron, it's true. The record calls it. We motioned myself and District 10 Councilman Clayton Perry for a property tax relief, rollback reduction. He voted against it twice. He was only for now the city homestead exemption because it's an election cycle. But for the last two years, he worked against the city homestead exemption. The record is very clear. And the other thing I tell you, too, is I'll be honest with you, I, I lease my home. I do. And I guess apparently to Ron, 
That is not good enough. I'm not a taxpayer because I lease my home. Well, if you're a renter or a leaser in this city, you better be careful if Ron Nuremberg's the mayor of San Antonio. But this, I'll tell you, we did it because I wanted to be near the hospital where my wife was closest to. So we found the home that made sense, and we stayed there. We ended up loving the neighborhood. And I've lived in the District 6 community literally 25 years. We just found a house we were happy with in the school area we wanted to be in, and we stuck it out. So I love the community I'm in, and that's where I stay where I'm at. But it's not about who pays property tax, who doesn't. At this case, I rent, I, I lease, and I'm okay with that. But what's most important is what we're doing at City Hall with those dollars in the first place. My position is to give it back wherever possible and to do more with what we have right now. The mayor's record is exactly the opposite. He's against property tax relief. Steve, Steve can, I, mayor, can I respond? Sure. This is not about there, him. You get the final say on okay. this. This question. is not about him being a renter. This is about him being a delinquent taxpayer. In fact, I thought this would come up, Councilman, so I printed out your delinquent tax report right here today. It has a date. You owe property taxes to the Bear County Appraisal District. That's, so if you'd like to take a look at it, I can give it to you false. now. There's no, it, it is there's a no, fact, no, Councilman. It has nothing to do with no, rental. No, it's not. Everyone is taking care of their fair share except for Councilman Brockhouse. Oh my God. All right, it, this is where I'm going to take the wide it, uh, it, I can birth leave it right here, here if anybody yeah, wants to see it. How do you answer it's, that assertion? Again, if you rent, whether you're a business owner or a landowner, homeowner, if you rent the, your home, you don't pay the property taxes. So yeah, I don't pay property taxes directly to the city. It is through the landowner, the homeowners, the property owners. So when you lease, that's how it works. Uh, Ron is attempting to do something. I, I don't know what he's doing. I mean, he wants to gimmick it up. I guess I could have brought the crime stats here and held it in front of him uh, to try to do something. But the bottom line is I don't, right? I don't own my home. I lease it. And if, if that's an affront to you, Ron, I'm sorry. But I'm going to continue to do the best I can. And I, I rent, period. So you can really use the logic on that one. If I rent, the taxes are paid by the homeowner. All right, let's move on. Next question is for you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. This comes from, uh, San, this comes from KSAT viewers who submitted these uh, to our SAQ question. Uh, Richard wants to know, what are your plans to bring high-tech jobs to SA and move us away from service industry jobs? Well, we're doing that right now, and thank you for that question. I think it's a critically important one. And what you've seen over the last two years, actually over the last decade really, is that San Antonio's economy is diversified because we've gotten strategic about how we go about job creation and workforce development. It starts with workforce development, and we're about to roll out a program to ensure that every Bear County child in San Antonio that's educated in Bear County High School has the opportunity, regardless of their circumstances, for college education or high skills training. That will ensure that our workforce to pipeline is strong, and it is strong in tech. Meanwhile, we're also working with our small business community in ensuring that they have an opportunity to grow, particularly in these targeted sectors. And when we talk about San Antonio and we, and we go and work for relocations and other businesses to come to San Antonio, we're focusing on developments like the tech sector downtown and out throughout the community. And the results are clear. More CEOs, more jobs, more um, businesses are choosing San Antonio because of our strong workforce and our good business climate, particularly around these targeted industries. Councilman Brockhouse. Can you repeat the question? Okay. Yeah, it was basically a question from Richard, one of our viewers, who, oh, wanted, okay, to, who wanted to know, what are your plans to bring high-tech jobs to San Antonio and move us away from service industry jobs? Well, we got to, fr frankly, we got to embrace every type of job that comes through the books, right? I mean, we have to be focused on all jobs in all industries. So the service industry in our Santa employs a lot of folks. So we have to do the best we can as also to bring that in and work hard for that. But at the end of the day, it's about who you are and how you sell San Antonio to the nation and to the state, right? The mayor is the number one salesperson. It's the top salesperson of the city. You have to believe in San Antonio's ability to employ and bring good jobs and good people to San Antonio. But the track record speaks for itself. The mayor does not believe in San Antonio. You only got to go back a couple of weeks to Chick-fil-A and that decision. The mayor drove out Chick-fil-A out of the airport, and that sent a national message that we're not open for business. He did the same thing with the Republican National Convention. After coming off the heels of the final four, the mayor stated we couldn't handle the Republican National Convention and turned them away. That was $250 million of economic impact. He turned away Amazon. If we don't get in the big fight for the jobs and the techs and the industries that matter, if the mayor doesn't believe in us, who will? So as mayor, I'm going to champion those issues. We're going to go after every job and opportunity we can, and we're going to work hard to tell the story that is San Antonio. Having lived here all my life, I know that story, right? I understand it. 
And that story is the strength of every one of us. And we should be going after service industry related jobs as well. As much as the tech industry pays the higher wages, we're not where we need to be on service industry jobs as well. That's wages and opportunities for them. It's better benefits and all these things that the business owner handles. But here's the truth. City Hall <laughs> doesn't create jobs. The business community does. So we have to create the environment so they can get that done and do it the right way. We make the rules and the, we level the playing field, but business owners create it, not City Hall. I'll tell you what we do. We inhibit it. We inhibit job growth and job opportunity by our actions at the council and the message we, spent, we send to the nation and to the state. That must change. As mayor, I believe in San Antonio. I'm going to fight for every job that comes here. Every single one of them is going to have a high priority for me. Thank you, Councilman. I, again, audience comments and applause. Let's wait till the end. But I, I'm guessing there's some things in there you would like to address, Mayor Nuremberg. I have to pick which one, but I'll, I'll say that Councilman Brockhouse's comments show a fundamental misunderstanding of basic market economics. We can only create jobs as fast as people move here, and we are the fastest growing city in the nation. In fact, we're at full, we're at full employment, meaning that anyone who wants a job in San Antonio has a job, and the 40,000 jobs that we've created over the last 10, uh, two years, the bulk of those jobs have been in high wage targeted sectors, meaning that our economic development strategy is working. It is working, and young people are finding increasingly an opportunity to find careers here, as addition to all of the other sectors that we have growing here in San Antonio. We are not losing sight of our service industry. In fact, those are growing as well. They're growing quite a bit, and we're going to continue that strategy that every job is a good job, but we've got to also diversify our economy, and that's occurring right now. All right. One of the questions that you brought up is actually on my list. When we talk about the Republican National Convention wanting to come to San Antonio and you saying no. When we talk about Amazon and the strategy that you implemented there, looking back at those, do you stand by your decisions in each of those instances? Yes, I do. And, and do you, which one would you like to discuss? I mean, so let's talk about the, the RNC. Uh, San Antonio is a convention city. Tourism is our, one of our top economies. The idea that anyone would drive out an organization or, or, or a business because of politics is laughable, and Councilman Brockhouse knows it. The truth is, I'm first and foremost, though, accountable to taxpayers. And I wasn't willing to put the full faith and credit uh, and, and you, the taxpayer, on the hook for the $65 million that the RNC wanted just to locate their convention year. In addition to that, we're not the only city. In fact, every city in America came to that conclusion as well, except for the one city that actually bid on, on the convention. And, and, and I will tell you this. If the DNC came to us with the same deal, they would have gotten the same answer. We work to make sure that we protect taxpayers, but we also grow the economy, which is why Forbes has called us one of the top, we are among the top 100 fastest growing metros in the country. We're number four. So you're saying politics had nothing to do with turning down the RNC. That's correct. It is all simple economics. Why would we put $65 million of your taxpayer dollars on the hook to bring a convention here when the, when the results, for the economic impact is, 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 very, is very uncertain and the, the results of previous conventions have not met their marks anyways? Councilman Brockhouse. Well, I was in the room, so I can tell you it was purely about politics with the Republican National Convention. Words like, we don't want those people here were used to describe the Republican National Convention. It's a message that you send. It's the words you use, right? We just came off the final four. And by the way, the $65 million would have been privately raised for the bulk of it. There was a committee that would have put that entire amount of funding together so that we could go with the city. We have, the city, of course, is going to guarantee because the city council has to be on board with that. Republican or Democrat should be welcomed in San Antonio. The truth is this. It's $250 million of economic impact. And an interesting fact is, well, we talk about public safety, $50 million of security equipment would have been left behind for the San Antonio Police Department. Guaranteed. It's happened in every city where they've held a convention. So the, the, the funding and the money is there. The return on the investment is there. It makes total sense. And if it was the Democrat National Convention, you better believe I'd be advocating for that as well. And if you're a Democrat, I think it's sad that you have somebody running, running for president right now and he couldn't have his convention in the city of San Antonio. There's something wrong with that mentality. We have to go after those opportunities and put it on the line and make sure we do the best we can. And we can say the same thing about Chick-fil-A. It was a religious freedom issue. The words on the council were spoken. I, don't, I didn't say the words. Council members said they are a hate group. That was the language used. That's highly political. 
as mayor, I would have stopped that debate right there and said, this isn't the message we want to send to the nation. We don't need to politicize the RFP contract in this point, but we did. The mayor sat complicit and watched it happen, and then he voted to ban him from the airport. You can't send those kinds of messages out. So we have to be, right, whether it's RNC. The mayor sent a letter to Jeff Bezos about Amazon and said, we don't, we're, we're, we're not going to give it. But if you want to come on down to town, you can, you can come on visit us, but we're not going to try. That is not a message that the top salesperson, the number one believer in our city, is the mayor of the city of San Antonio. That's not the message we want to send. We go for it. Even if we can't win, we try. We get in the game and we get in the fight. I just want to clarify one thing that you said. You're saying that in the proposal that was in front of the city council, they called Chick-fil-A a hate group? Yes. Those words were used. Symbol of hate. That okay. was the exact word. Is that how you remember it, Mr. Mayor? No. In fact, everything that the council member is attributing to other people, including me, is totally false. Um, and he knows it. And the fact that he's getting away with saying all these outlandish things makes it uh, a, a, this a ridiculous um, I mean, he's going to have to answer for all the inaccuracy and mistruths that he has said here. And we don't simply have enough time for me to also address the questions that people actually want to know if I'm having to address his hot air half the time. And Steve. I just want to clarify what my, my remembrance is. The, words, I'll, I'll the word you, symbol of hate were used. We can talk about but, but but the mayor, The my, mayor just lied. My the word symbol of hate were used. My remembrance was that it was because Chick-fil-A was supporting groups that were deemed to be anti-LGBTQ. That was one part of the conversation. Another council member called them a symbol of hate. This dialogue is occurring. Okay, so they may have called them that, but that wasn't actually on the paper that you voted on. No, no, but, well, okay. no, but you're okay. voting on that want, dialogue. Was... No, I'm referring to the dialogue sure. of, the, of the day. As that vote was occurring, those are, that's the language used. As mayor, you should have stopped that immediately and said, these aren't the reasons we're voting on this. This wasn't in the RFP. The hours of operation weren't in the RFP. The, it, none of that was in the RFP. We began debating things that got out of the bounds of reasonableness, and it should have ended right there. We well, should not have made that out. Let, let's talk about the Chick-fil-A, because we've got, I mean, uh, of the SAQ questions that we got uh, at ksat.com, most of them were about Chick-fil-A. Just to clarify, what is your position on the Chick-fil-A proposal that the city council voted on? My position is very clear. It was a violation of religious freedom, period. And the words used on the dais that day were very clear. They talked about the donations of a, a gentleman in his comments from seven years ago, the owner of Chick-fil-A. It was brought into the dais as an anti-LGBT, anti-NDO organization. That is absolutely false. Chick-fil-A adheres to the non-discrimination ordinance. They donate based on their religious beliefs. That is as clean as it has ever been, night and day. I want to be very clear. There was nothing. The mayor is going to tell you it was about economics and it was about being closed on Sunday. The contract and the RFP, the request for proposal, had nothing to do with hours of operation. Being closed on Sunday was already vetted by the city attorney's office. It was not a problem, and they were included. So it comes down to right, a value and a morality-based decision that somebody put into the RFP at the last minute. The mayor is scrambling to get an answer for it, so he's living on the edges with this, well, it's because they don't, it's, it's we're going to lose profitability. I'm here to tell you, Chick-fil-A does business, more business in six days than any of those restaurants do in seven they do it because they close on Sunday, and that also helps out. But you know what? We should honor the fact they close on Sundays. That's an honorable thing to do. It's a faith adherence, and we should thank them for that because their families can go home and worship, or they can watch a football game or do whatever they want. A day of rest is not the end of the world. And by the way, they put people before profit, and that's why I respected them, and I think they should be a part of it. So my goal is to force – we've got to come back and revote this thing, put them back in the contract because it has become – a national embarrassment. That issue and that vote has triggered dialogue across the nation that says, I'm not sure I want to do business there. And if I have a faith belief in anything traditional of faith, I cannot get work in certain local areas that, that the city of San Antonio has anything to touch. That is a bad message that's being sent. The mayor can't run from the message. Can't run from it. And you can't run from the language that's used on the dais that day. What we should have done we should have paused. The mayor should have recognized it was getting out of control. This is a failed leadership moment. He should have said, this has to stop. We need to take it back to committee and debate this in a fair and reasonable manner with facts. Mayor Nuremberg. Well, Chick-fil-A wasn't in the original RFP when it was scored in the first place. And I know that Councilman Brockhouse would love to spend the next 
all, all evening talking about Chick-fil-A so he doesn't have to defend his personal or political record. But here's the truth. I'm, I'm glad we have the opportunity to explain why we voted the way we did. The truth of the matter is I don't care about – in fact, I applaud Chick-fil-A for their faith-based business model, and I do not concern myself with who they donate to. But the truth of the matter is this was a four, contract four years in the making. I wasn't willing to scuttle it for political purposes that some had wanted us to do. 1.5 million people walk through our airport on a Sunday. That's 15 percent of our traveling public. What I want to do is make sure that when they walk through in the scarce retail space that there is, that they walk in with a full array of options, not a darkened food court. And in a contract that's emphasizing local, that has smoke shack, local coffee, uh, luxury, it even has a spur store, I want to make sure that we emphasize local as much as possible. And the truth of the matter is, no matter how this vote turned out, it was going to be controversial. If it went the other way, there'd be another part of our community that had equal anguish about the results of the vote. So at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we do what's right for the airport, for the customers it serves, as well as for the city in general, and that's why I voted the way I did. Thank you. Let's talk about some, uh, we have another question from the audience here. And it has to do with the uh, north side neighborhoods for organized development. They support neighborhood issues like neighborhood crime, traffic congestion, code compliance, property taxes, planning and zoning issues, air and water quality. How would you address those issues? I mean, there's a lot of things you can you can pick and choose from those those issues if you'd like, Councilman. But how would you address those issues? Obviously, traffic congestion in San Antonio, especially in this part of San Antonio, is an issue. Well, you got to think, too, about the resources and the dollars that are flying around in, in, at City Hall. Got to put them to the issues that matter most. So back to what I do as a council person, right? I go right back to my track record in District 6. I feel my team and I were successful because we are there, we are present, and we are working with neighborhood associations. A strong neighborhood association, right? If we had, out of the 240 neighborhoods, if we had 200 nods, do you understand how great it would be? across the entire city. We have communities and neighborhood associations that are struggling and they need the help. So we've got to build a baseline of those to raise up the neighborhoods. They are the number one conduit uh, for a council person and his team, his or her team to be successful, right? So we have to spend the time in the neighborhoods. And I think you go after, the first signs for me as a community leader of trouble are code compliance issues. That's the first sign that a neighborhood is in trouble because you see grass starting to get overgrown, broken windows that don't get fixed, garage doors that aren't working, cars that are parked that don't ever seem to move. So in my community, we focus on the things that build a better neighborhood, right? And then one of the biggest things, biggest things I learned too was cleanliness, the illegal dumping and the things that are getting thrown out on our streets and neighborhoods. Over the span of 2018, we picked up 222 tons of trash on site. We measured it and kept track of it for a whole year. 220 tons of trash in our neighborhoods, just picking them up time to time. We set up block walks. We were setting up cleanups. We we're helping the homeless community. You have to get involved. And I think you start with code compliance and you get back to basics and you help educate. The biggest thing I've also learned, and this is to the credit of residents, if they know the rules, they follow the rules. Almost 99 out of 100 times. So if you get in front of them and code compliance is educating, we're working with neighborhoods. We tell them the grass can be this high, you have this long to fix it. I'm telling you, the community responds to that. They just have to understand and be a part of it. So that relationship with neighborhoods is that gap that I am going to close. The people who know best are the people in the neighborhoods, not the people at City Hall. It, that's not where the work of this community is. It's not at City Hall. It's in the neighborhood associations, it's in the homeowner associations, doing the hard work of listening and executing the basics first. Mayor Nurnberg. As councilman, as mayor, I have continued to work directly with the neighborhoods to understand their concerns whenever they arise, particularly as it relates to zoning issues. And that's where an organization like Northside Neighbors for Organized Development is, is critically important. They have to be the voice for a conglomerate of neighborhood associations, and so our work at City Hall is to ensure that we have strong neighborhoods and we have strong neighborhood voices at the table. That makes sure that that is making sure that zoning and planning meetings are accessible. They occur when people can actually attend them. That also in, means that city council offices need to have a direct connect to the neighborhoods and a constant source of uh, feedback for the concerns that are going on. Code compliance is an issue. Environmental sustainability is an issue. Crime and public safety is an issue, which is why we also focused on San Antonio safe, the San Antonio fear-free environment, the public, uh, public safety officers that are working directly with the neighborhoods. All of those things matter. Quality of life should be our key metric for success in our community, throughout our community, in every neighborhood in town, and that's what we remain focused on. Councilman? 
Well, look, I mean, neighborhoods first, and that, that, that's the leadership mentality we need to take at City Hall. It's, it's really it's about as basic you can get and understanding what matters most to the community and the neighborhoods. That means teams got to get out there. People got to talk to folks in the neighborhoods, and you got to understand it. That's why we kept block walking. We kept going. We didn't stop just because the election ended. We spent the time in the neighborhoods asking voter and non-voter alike, because oftentimes what happens at City Hall, too, by the way, and you know this, this is it, people only get their doors knocked if they have a voter registration history in city elections. I don't, I don't play that game. As a council member, I go to every door. We're getting into apartment complexes. We're trying to build a better neighborhood from cleanliness, code compliance, animal care services, those basics that need to be funded first. So I think that the track record of District 6 speaks for itself. We work hard to do that in partnership with our neighborhoods. And as mayor, that's the gap I'm going to work on to close. I'm going to be present not just at election time. I will be at those neighborhoods, whether it's in District 3 at Highland Hills, whether it's in Valley Forest in District 4, the Great Northwest, you can count on my presence every week in the neighborhoods of San Antonio. Mayor Nuremberg, next, next question comes from our KSAT viewers. This person wants to know, would you support a plastic bag ban? in the city of San Antonio? Well, we've worked on this in the past, and in fact, uh, the plastic bag bans that we uh, were seeing come up through uh, the cities of Texas have actually been struck down by the courts. So what we're doing, we're focusing on what the real impact can be, which is we want to see fewer plastic bags out in the community, out in parks and, and just blowing all over the place that make our entire city drag down. So we've focused on our recycling efforts, and San Antonio today has one of the strongest plastic bag recycling programs in the nation. In fact, we have a single stream recycling uh, program that ensures plastic bags go in the trash, go in the recycling, and now are taken care of rather than ending up in our storm sewers and our parks and so forth. So that's a no. You would not support it's a not, It's not legal at the city level anymore. No, no, and I do not support a, uh, support a plastic bag ban, and I would not put that before the council. I think we have to be careful of the overreach and the, count, the things the city council does that get into the business environment and the business world. I think we have a great recycling program. Our solid waste uh, department is fantastic, one of the best in the nation, uh, led by David McCary. He's a fantastic director and leader in the city of San Antonio. I think we need to do the things that matter most, we need to get back to basics. We need to focus on the recycling. And we need to learn as a city council what we should be involved in and what we shouldn't be involved in. That starts to move into a business arena that I think that the community, the business leaders are going to drive their conversation. The market will push that. I mean, you can look at examples of folks like Starbucks, right, and what they've done and how they've built their recycling program around straws and other things. We can count on business to do the right things. I don't believe we should be interfering in that, nor should we be, uh, you know, advocating for any plastic bag then. All right, I, I'm going to just move on since you since you've been we're kind of talking about the climate here. So I want to ask you the next question, Councilman. Uh, the city is developing a climate action plan designed to fight global warming. The first draft called for the city be, to become carbon neutral by 2050. Some businesses are concerned it goes too far and could harm economic development. Where do you stand today on the first draft of the climate action plan? You well, know, look, if I'm mayor, we're going to put the brakes on the climate action adaptation plan. We have to slow it down and make sure that the number one factor that's involved in there is a cost analysis. Every item must have a dollar value assigned to it because at the end of the day, someone's going to pay for it. And I can guarantee you who it's going to be. It's everybody in this room. Homeowners, taxpayers, your fees, your resources, they're going to increase. That plan has the potential to be between 5 and $8 billion. When the plan was presented, the first draft to the city council, it had dollar signs by it. That's all it had, Do dollar signs. The more dollar, if it had three dollar signs, that meant it potentially could cost billions. If it had one dollar sign, it was millions. I, we, can't, we, we cannot work like that. So from the beginning of this program, look, look, I am for clean air, recycling, renewable energy sources. I support those things. I think we all do, right? But you, you can't be against the environment. But what happens is you have to balance those as a leader when it comes to how you spend your money and resources. Someone's going to pay for it. It's the residents. So the best thing we can do is take a step back, slow down on this thing, and assign dollar values to it. Let's make sure they make sense. And if it works within the budget and the community supports it, by the way, because there are, there are things in there that we can do that are very cost effective, that have a, have a very straightforward return on our investment. Those are the things we need to do. But you're right at the beginning, you said some business. I'm here to tell you most businesses in this town are scared to death of the Climate Action Adaptation Plan. It is government overreach at its finest. 
It is a multi-billion dollar program, and it's a job killer if we don't watch out. That's re there's reasons why Valero, Newstar, the biggest employers in our city, the, the chambers of commerce are saying, slow down. Be careful, because in your drive to do that, there's ancillary effects, there's benefits, but there could be severe problems with job growth and job creation. So we gotta, we gotta take that, slow it down and stop it, and we gotta tell those folks, look, we want a dollar value there. Then we're gonna analyze it and make sure it makes sense, and we're gonna take it to the community. The community should have the final say. Mayor Nuremberg, the climate action plan, the first draft, yeah. your thoughts? All of the groups that will be impacted, and that is everyone in this community, businesses, nonprofit organizations, neighborhoods, and individual citizens are at the table as we get this plan right. It is a set of goals. I, like the rest of the community, support clean air, clean water for the future of our city. And that's why we're working on a plan to address it. We have achieved uh, a goal. To, we, we have set it as a community over the next 30 years. We're working towards strategies to make sure that we hand off to the next generation a community locally and throughout the globe that has all those things. So this is a set of goals, and we are working towards a cost-benefit analysis. We're putting the process in the plan to make sure that the things that we cannot anticipate, and there are many parts of this plan that will be done over the next 30 years, where we can't anticipate all of the technology improvements that will be made available over the next 30 years. So we have a procedure in place, a cost-benefit analysis, economic impact statement, and public participation before we make any of those actions. But this here today, the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, is a framework to to get us to the next level, which is actually implementation over the next 30 years. Councilman Brockhouse, do you agree that something should be done? Yo, yes, I agree. We cannot turn our back on, for instance, even the, uh, I mean, the ozone levels. We have to be, we, we have worked with Alamo Area Council of Governments, ACOG, the city council, our city climate team. They're all working together to chart the best path forward. But the biggest concern every one of us has to have is how much it costs. I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't City Hall's money. It's your money. It's the taxpayer dollars. So I just want to make sure that the costs make sense and there's a clear return on that investment that's measurable. The mayor says it's just a set of ideas. That's funny. The set of ideas always turns into a set of spending costs and someone always pays for it. You just can't say we're doing this just for a bunch of ideas. We're doing it because we're going to implement things in our policy and in our programs. And it could be something as simple as the cars you drive, the material you use to build your house, right? The light bulbs you use, you don't know where this is going to end, but it can begin with clear cost conversation. That's the most honest thing you can do, right? Is say, look, this is what it is, San Antonio. Is this where you want to go? I would argue that that's not where San Antonio wants to go. We want to take care of these items, Time's but up. we want to do them in a reasonable, fiscally responsible manner. Time's up. Mr. Mayor. We all share those concerns. That's why we're doing it thoughtfully. We're doing it with everyone at the table, and we're doing it with a broad understanding of what the cost-benefit analysis will be as we move forward. We will not be able to implement our strategies without thoughtful planning, and that's where we are today, and that's why we're including the entire community in the dialogue. All right. Next question, since we're talking about some of this fits into the Climate Action Plan, when you talk about multimodal transportation in the city of San Antonio. An initial plan has been put out there. Uh, that includes bike lanes, some studies on self-driving cars, and accelerated routes for some of the via buses that are out there. How do you accelerate, pardon the pun, the multimodal transportation idea in San Antonio? Well, we take it to the community. We ask for voter approval. It is a citizen-driven plan, and by next year, will be voter approved. And it will have the priorities in spending, the priorities to make sure that this plan will be implemented. What we need to do is, is recognize the fact that if we continue to do the same things over and over again on transportation, that is not a solution. It's very clear. If we do that, your traffic commute time over the next 20 years will be up 75%. We're adding about 105 vehicles to area roadways every single day. We need a multimodal approach, which is exactly what Connect SA is, and we're getting public feedback and review of that plan right now. It will feature our street network, improvements of our streets to improve areas of congestion, our pedestrian, our sidewalk network, as well as safer bike routes, as well as improved bicycle, excuse me, improved bus routes, which we have already shown. If we improve bus routes, we have a marked effect, improvement on traffic congestion, and ultimately bringing mass transit to San Antonio and so all of that is happening right now and it will be brought to voters for approval next year councilman Brockhouse your your plan for accelerating the multimodal transportation idea uh, my plan starts at the basics and that's working with via 
uh, we, VIA actually has half the funding of every big city in the state. They do more with less. In the fact, they have billions less, VIA does. The city council, of which I approved as well, I voted in favor of awarding them another $10 million every year to work on capacity building, right, to help them build, to bring more traffic and quicker response time. So instead of waiting 20 minutes on a bus, you're, you're waiting 10 or 12, right? The, the shorter the wait time, the more likely people are to use public transportation. So we, I think we invest in VIA. I believe they have the right answers when it comes to transportation. So we go and we invest in VIA and we work that full cent. We get them the funding they need to be effective. So VIA first. And then there's this capacity conversation. I sit on um, the Alamo area MPO. And we have a lot of conversations about the millions of dollars that are going around capacity building. And you live it every day, whether it's on Hardy Oak or Gold Canyon, wherever you're trying to get from anywhere from Northwest Military 1604 or I-10-1604 up to Gold Canyon, it's lights out. We have to build more roads. People are moving into these areas. So we have to work in conjunction with folks like the Alamo Area MPO, the state of Texas, to build the capacity for this neighborhood and this community to move around. It is very difficult. And I don't know. I, I, my Anecdotally, we, no, we knock these doors. We walk these neighborhoods. Nobody's happy with traffic congestion. And it's not getting any better. It's getting worse. So we have to make those investments. And we've We've moved forward with it a little bit on VIA, but I think we've got to capitalize on that. From a multimodal conversation, we have to move it to, we see success with bike lanes. We've seen some success with scooters, and then it went south. So we can learn the good things, and we can also learn the things that aren't working. But at the basic root of it, it's VIA, and it's building more roads, especially for communities out here, starting in Santerra and all these neighborhoods, that your commute time is increasing. It, that is trouble no matter how you spell it. I want to get you out of the car and home as quickly as possible. That means we need to make the investment. Mayor Nurnberg. An improved street network as well as improved bus routes for VIA. Full funding of VIA is a fundamental part of the Connect SA plan. In fact, I led council in 2017 to improve the bus routes, particularly in those areas that are most needed. 18 routes on VIA are already improved, and we've seen a 30 to 40 percent increase in ridership just on those routes. Connect SA takes the work of VIA, integrates it with the Alamo Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, and MPO, improves street capacity, as well as integrates all of the, all of the different modes of transportation to bring us truly the first and most innovative comprehensive transportation plan the city has ever seen. That's what will be in front of voters in 2020 next year. And that's what we also need voter approval on to make sure that we have the priorities right so it can actually be implemented. It can be funded. Otherwise, we're just talking as we have been for the last 30 years. Councilman Brockhouse, the next question comes from KSAT.com, our SAQ question from Adriana. She says there's a serious issue happening around San Antonio in regards to the increase in mail theft and cluster box break-ins around the city. Residents are victims of identity, credit card, and check theft. What is the city willing to do or able to do to help residents? Well, this is, uh, this is an issue I championed on city council. Uh, I put together a council resolution that asked for a mailbox theft task force and at the very least to have a conversation, right? Signed by four of my colleagues, we put it in and we've been having this conversation over the last year because the mailbox theft issue is huge, huge in my district and it's not just when they get stolen either because you're losing your checks. Sometimes you're losing medication now. I mean, you're losing all kinds of important things. That identity theft issue and a mailbox issue is important. We have to stop it. So some of it begins with basic things like better boxes, better keys. But you know where most of the residents struggled that I learned through the process of trying to fix this issue? They struggled in getting the box fixed again. Right? They had to come back for months to see their box fixed. So guess where they had to go get their mail? They're at the post office. The line is long. And they didn't go check their mail. And they were missing things. So the issue is bigger than just the loss of something at that moment. It's your, it's your life and your ability to get back to it. A lot of us are on email and digital in this world. I get it. But you'd be surprised how many people are still living. They, they go check that mail every morning. It is that important to them. So I think what we have to do is we put together this thing. We shot it up to Austin now. It's in Austin's hands. Uh, Representative Minjares and, Repres and uh, Senator uh, Menendez have been looking around as well to see what we can do and try to implement stronger uh, protocols around this. This has actually been done before in Austin. Uh, in the previous session, they tried to strengthen them, but it comes down to laws that make sense that hold people accountable. After that implementation, Chief McManus told me that, you know, we we're all talking together. The one thing we learned from that process that my team and I put together was that there wasn't good enough communication between the post office, between SAPD, between the federal authorities. So the team came and worked together. Didn't have to form anything over it. What we found out was that communication and understanding what mattered most to the neighborhoods, which was getting the box fixed and back in shape as quickly as possible. Stronger laws, 
makes sense. Better boxes, and that means a little bit of building code. So if someone comes in and builds a neighborhood, you got to put the right size box in it, not something with an aluminum backing that's ripped off in 30 seconds. And then make sure we enforce those laws when the time comes and hold those, those, th those thieves accountable. Mayor Nuremberg. We're actually in agreement on this. In fact, it's in the involvement of the state legislature as well as Congress, the federal government, and the authority of the United States Postal Service that we've been working collaboratively with SAPD over the last several years. Uh, so we'll continue to do that to ensure that we have a good handle on mail theft and people don't have to worry about whether or not they're going to receive their bills and medication and so forth. Councilman, you have anything to add? I mean, you seem, you seem well, to I, both agree on this. I, I, you seem, I, are you I'm speechless? Not, I'm not shocked. There's, there, <laughs> I'm not shocked at all. We, look, the, the, the point is that oftentimes at City Hall, what we get caught up in is the five to seven things we disagree on. And the truth is, you know, we all have got the best work we're doing for neighborhoods. We see the different path. And this one, Ron and I converge on. And he's, you know, he's right just as much as I'm right, right? This, the focus is on the resident. Let's get the box back in shape as quickly as possible. Get you your mail, medicines, your paychecks, whatever it is that's coming to you. Let's protect you. And that's something that I think all 11 of us on city council would completely wholeheartedly agree on. Next question is from the audience. Uh, Mayor, what are your plans for the future of the airport? Well, it's a great question and it's something we're working actively on. The big question has always been where should the airport of the future be? And I, I thought way back that it should be right where it's at today. Wouldn't it be a strategic competitive advantage for us, the seventh largest city in the United States, to have an international airport right in the heart of our city? 15 minutes away from any business, residential, or visitor destination uh, you would like to go to. That's our airport today. The truth of the matter is the airport is a trailing indicator of the success of our economy. And our economy is booming. And so what has that resulted in? A 50% increase over the last 22 months or so of new market activity, new nonstop, new direct connections. So our airport is beginning to thrive. And what that means is we're about to get to capacity where we're going to actually need to plan for the future of infrastructure at the airport. So I worked uh, with collaboratively with the military community, the business community, aviation experts to assemble a plan for that and it's rolling out here in the spring. It's taken some time to get all the data together but they will show a path forward, a master plan for the new San Antonio International Airport right where it's at today. What we have to do is ensure that we build our airfield capacity and that includes an, a second independent runway so that both runways can be used as our, our new air traffic grows. And we also, 20 and 30 years out, are going to have to build new terminal capacity. The truth of the matter is everyone was shocked when new aviation director Russ Handy told the city council several years ago that we are not landlocked. That broke one of the biggest myths in town that we couldn't grow that airport. The truth is we can and we will. Councilman Brockhouse. Well, I sit on the Transportation Committee, and we've been vetting back and forth uh, a new airport plan. And an additional runway in the location is, is going to be the future. At least that's where it was when we discussed it a few months back. I would tell you, though, there was concern on the council, uh, on that committee. And the concern was, what are we doing? Is this really the, is this the highest and best possibility for the airport? And, and another council member, to his credit, actually said, we need to be also looking at a regional airport to make sure that that's not the final path. The funding is a huge mountain to climb. There's a lot of federal issues that come with that. There's a lot of federal funding dollars. But the, the regional airport issue was still brought up because people have concerns about the size of that. The secondary air, uh, runway is, was part of the master plan, and I think we saw the positives in that as well. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about flights and direct routes. San Antonio always lags in that, and it has been a problem. And we see that coming up, up and down. Sometimes we have direct connectors. Sometimes we lose some here or there. Flights are, are in and out. But I think we've been doing overall well. We've been incrementally getting better at the airport, and that's the general handy, Russ Handy's leadership. Uh, but I think we need to take it to the next level. We cannot get involved in the airport without understanding that it's about direct connectors. Uh, and we have to fight Time, for that. That you, is a federal issue. Did you just, just give me a stop sign? No, he gave me a one-minute okay, sign. Sorry. I just saw the stop yeah. sign behind him, so... It's yeah. all good. Okay. Uh, all right, go ahead. No, sorry, my, my apologies. You broke my flow right yeah, there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> my, 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 my big question was, do you support the airport at its current location? That's uh, what I was going to ask you. You know, I, th I, like the, I like the master plan. Interested in the cost for it and uh, putting that second runway in. More interested in what that looks like 25 to 35 years from now, 40 years from now. So that's why I'm not giving up on a regional airport yet, and we have to consider that. I think, I think you have to think big on this one. This is a massive message we're going to send, and with where Austin's at and with where we're at, we lose that battle almost daily to Austin when it comes to direct flights and opportunities. So we got to get better at that one. I think it's going to take a lot of work. So when, and when you say regional airport, you're talking about something that would be between San Antonio and yes, Austin. Yes, yes. 
Kind or of like larger, or we're going to expand it out. That is a that is a billion dollar project. So you have to be very careful that that makes sense in the growth pattern in the future of San Antonio. I don't think we toss it out at the, and we we end it, but I think we have to have that conversation right now. Does the second airport fulfill us for the next 25? The second runway for the next 25 years? And, and so far, the answer looks like yes. But the task force has done a good job with that and brought it back to us uh, so that we can make a good recommendation to the full council. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. I apologize for breaking your flow. It's okay. I was like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Nuremberg, the idea of a regional airport has been put been out there discussed. before. It's been discussed. Austin, in Austin, a lot of people, I mean, I, I have, I confess I have driven to Austin to fly out of Austin before because yeah. they had nonstop flights and the, cheap, the flights were often cheaper. Yeah, and, and that is the exact question that this committee of experts, aviation experts, military and business, mm -hmm. answered. And then, frankly, I would trust their answer based on data more than I would pol uh, trust politicians who have liked to wax poetic about this over the last 30 years. The truth is, from an efficiency standpoint and from an FAA authorization standpoint, we have to remain at this airport. And when it comes to cost benefit, the, the dollars it will take, which are mostly federal dollars to expand the current airport, pales in comparison on what we would waste, the billions, 10, 15 billion, on a brand new airport regionally that is not going to get traffic anyways because there's two of the largest hubs in North America right within 150, 200 miles of us. I want to ask a personality question uh, first to you, Councilman Brockhouse. Name a former San Antonio mayor that you would pattern yourself after, or you do pattern, pattern yourself after, that you feel you most closely resemble in your leadership style and your vision? Boy, that, is that a Spreester question, or was that, that an online? That's a Spreester question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know what, you got to take, uh, it, it's really taken a little bit of the good from a bunch of them. I, I don't think I would single out any one in particular. Uh, I would think that, uh, you know, during Henry Cisneros' term, the city grew uh, in leaps and bounds. And I think that that leadership, that neighborhood, I, I actually worked uh, for the for Secretary Cisneros' wife on the city council as a council aide. And uh, when the secretary would come out to the neighborhoods and he'd walk a neighborhood, boy, everybody was coming out of that house. He understood what it meant to be a community first leader. And he was in those neighborhoods, in those communities, and they loved him for it. I mean, I, so I would want to pattern myself after that. And then I think you come in, you could pick a little bit you know, from Phil Hardberger as well, right? His ability to unite the council and move a goal. I mean, that, that's admirable as well. May not always agreed with the policies or the politics of what he done, but you know what he did? He united that council and he pushed people forward on an issue and he got a lot done in four years. I think Ivy Taylor had a lot of great things about what she was doing as well. And I liked her focus on faith and community. And I, I appreciated that. So the way she guided herself from her heart as a, as a family person, I really loved the way uh, she kept faith at the forefront of who she was. So I think it's a pick and choose of, of, of each person uh, that you can sit back. But those are the three that, that jump out at me. Uh, and then I, I had in Mayor uh, Howard Peake for what his visionary work on our greenways, the trail systems, and all these things that he saw going forward. I mean, you can go down the line. I, I wouldn't pick any one, but I think we're blessed for having a set of leaders that brought something to the table. And San Antonio, the beauty of it is we survive no matter what. Like, that's how great this community is. People love their city. And they're, who their leader is is a part of that. And we all pick and choose something in them. And you're going to have to do that on May 4th. Uh, and from my point of view, it's, it's what you think is personal and individual to you. And you could probably find something great about every mayor we've been through. And the challenges for them, too, the things they, we, we wish they would have done better. So great question, man. That one's out of left field. Solid. I try to throw them at you guys every once in a while. <laughs> uh, the same one to you, Mayor Nuremberg. Name a former San Antonio mayor you pattern yourself after or that you feel you most closely resemble in your leadership style and vision. Well, I have great admiration uh, and respect for a number of our mayors. Um, you know, and, and frankly, all of the living mayors have done an incredible job for our city. I will tell you the ones that I have grown closest to over the years and uh, the ones I have modeled myself after and, and feel an affinity towards and the things that they were doing as a council and as a mayor are Mayor Howard Peake and Mayor Phil Hardberger. Uh, mayor Howard Peake had the vision of an emerald ring around the city. He championed the parks, but he came from the neighborhoods. Uh, I was a neighborhood association president. I served at Northside Neighbors for Organized Development. Howard Peake's uh, focus was on ensuring communities, our neighborhoods were well represented and were protected and were championed at City Hall. That's what I have done my entire career. But my, my hero, uh, one of my heroes in, in public life and my mentor and friend is Mayor Phil Hardberger. 
Uh, he continues to do great work. Uh, we see it here in the facility that we're in. He continues to do important work for our community. Uh, and I'm proud of the job that he's done, and I'm proud to be his friend. Next question to you, Mayor. Uh, this comes from the North Side Neighborhoods uh, for Organized Development. Next year will be 2020. What are your plans to implement the goals set out by the community that started with SA 2020 and later SA Tomorrow? Well, um, it, it's very clear. Uh, I was a, a very involved as a, a concerned citizen and as, and as a neighborhood leader during SA 2020. I was the chairman of the SA Tomorrow Plan, which is the action-making part of the SA 2020 vision, which was a community-wide vision. The entire community, all corners of our city, got together and said, where do we want to see our city over the next 10 years and beyond for our children and our grandchildren's sake? And what we said is we wanted it to be a safe city, an affordable city, a city that moves, that has a strong transportation system, and a city that respects its environment and that has a sustainable ecosystem for the next for the next generation. If you look at my track record, that's exactly what I've focused on. And those are tough challenges. Housing affordability. We were the first city in the nation to deliver a comprehensive housing strategy to get in front of what has become a housing crisis in cities across the country. We did that in my term right now. Over the last two years, we've also been working on a climate and action, and adapt action and adaptation plan to ensure that we have realistic goals and we have realistic strategies to ensure the next generation has clean water, clean air, and so forth. And the transportation network. We've been longing for a multimodal transportation system to get us out of congestion to keep our economy moving. That's exactly what we're doing with Connect SA. And to be a safe city. Again, I inherited what was a 25-year high in crime, and we've dropped it twice as fast to the nation's average, we drop it over the last two years to what is a 30-year low. I'm very proud of that work. It's all strategic. It's all focused. It all takes persistence, but it's progress, and I'm very proud of that foundation we've laid, and that's what you will continue to expect from me over the next two and more years. Councilman Brockhouse. We have to, so SA Tomorrow and, and, and SA 20, the Decade of Downtown, uh, all these things that focused on a particular area of our city. I think I'm, I'm excited to see what we can do with SA Tomorrow going forward into the future, as long as it mirrors what matters most to neighborhoods and communities. Uh, I deal with it um, in, in the West Side Regional Center over in District 6. Um, and one of the things people are most concerned about, which is with all the planning, the zoning opportunities, the things we're trying to do, is they don't want to lose their identity of their community. Th that, that is what I hear every meeting I go to. Everybody wants some piece of development. They want it for their neighborhood and community. And I would tell you, over the last two years, four years, six years, eight years, a lot of that development and opportunity and growth has been centered in one particular portion of town. That's usually downtown, and it doesn't spread out to other areas of the city. There's a lot of forgotten communities in San Antonio, and I have them in District 6. While we're separated by Loop 410, we've got an inside portion in the west side in the Edgewood School District that I worry for them. You stopping me at the again? <laughs> did you, uh, it wasn't a rebuttal that was a I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like man did two minutes go that fast yeah. uh, you're, you're good you're good you're good I, if you don't mind I still have a minute right yeah you're fine okay so we have to be very careful right that we don't change people's culture life and, and their ability to live and grow up and, and raise their family and their neighborhoods and communities that means we got to take care of the cultural designations we got to work on the historical pieces we do that with old highway 90 and that west side regional center in, in, in district 6 so I want to make sure we come at it. We're going, to have to, we're going to bring development and growth everywhere. That's one of the things I championed as soon as I came onto the city council. I said a lot of the incentives and everything going downtown needed to end. The decade of downtown has run its course. It's time we take those incentives and opportunities and push them out to the neighborhoods. I authored a council consideration request for my colleagues, signed it, to push those opportunities and incentives out to the neighborhoods. And we're building a 300 plus and partnering with a, a great developer to build a 300 plus million dollar development in District 6 on Petranco Road. It's going to be an amazing game changer opportunity. So we have to bring all that opportunity out. I think SA Tomorrow lays a groundwork and a blueprint for that. I think the city staff has been phenomenal on the outreach. Got to give them credit where credit's due. But we have to make sure it mirrors the neighborhoods. It doesn't change who we are culturally. And it works that nobody gets displaced and people get to call their homes homes for the rest of their lives. They can pass them on to generations and families after that. All right, I'm going to move on to one final question before you give your closing statements here. And it's, it's for you, Councilman Brockhouse, and then for you, Mayor Nuremberg. This is, again, from the audience, taking the final two questions from the audience because I want them to, you know, be like me. Uh, this is from the uh, audience. What is your plan 
regarding public safety, i.e. police and fire? Well, you know, I'm endorsed by both the police officers and the firefighters. Uh, and I consider public safety job one of any elected official. Whether you're the president of the United States, governor of Texas, lieutenant governor, mayor of San Antonio, it doesn't make a difference. Job one is securing neighborhoods for families that grow, live, and, 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 and prosper, period. Um, I think we have to focus on a couple of things. One is restoring trust between police officers and firefighters and city hall that was broken over years of animosity and lawsuits. We have to fix it. The police officers found their contract and got it done. Frankly, the firefighters need to continue negotiating, working hard to get their contract done as well. But the, at the end of the day, when I look at that, I see a broken trust. For instance, the city of San Antonio sued them for four straight years, spent $2 million in legal fees, only to lose all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court. The city lost five times. <laughs> so their legal strategy didn't work. And in doing that, it broke trust between the police officers, firefighters, and city hall. We have to restore that. And I think we do it in a way that manages and, and honors their service while protecting taxpayer resources. That we have to do. We've got a great team negotiating it. And our city attorney and that staff is after them. They're going to do that right now with the firefighters. But I think we have to go back and talk about the simple things like staffing, right? We can't be 180 police officers short, right? That number has hovered over there far back as when we canceled cadet classes in 2013. And we can't just say, well, we've hired all these cadets, and these cadets are going to come in because there's two things that are usually left out. A cadet's not on the street by themselves for a year. So we have, may have classes coming. Those classes have attrition, and by the way, they're not on the street by themselves for a long period of time, so we're short officers. And by the way, every month, officers are retiring. So there's this math that goes into it that always leaves us short. And they're short because it's tough to be a police officer anywhere in the nation right now. So we have to fix, make sure the compensation model makes sense and take care of them and restore that trust. Staffing, and then back to basics on the safe unit, the fear-friendly in the fear family environment, we've got to go back into making sure that they have the resources, right? The safe units, the community policers are in the neighborhoods doing the things that matter most to community and bringing the law enforcement Thank straight you. to the doorstep. Thank you, Councilman. Mayor Nuremberg? We need to continue to keep up the good work. Uh, we need to continue to build on our success. We have to stay firm on our foundation. And you've seen that in the work that we've do been doing. The, the, the numbers that Councilman Brockhouse is giving about police offer, officer vacancies is just simply not true. Over the last two years, uh, we have introduced new cadet classes to bring our, our what was a vacancy problem down to three at the end of the spring with this uh, new police officer uh, cadet class. But we have to stay vigilant on crime. And most importantly, we have to focus on the epidemic level of domestic violence in this city. That's where we need to make headway because that is driving some serious crime in our community. I want to move to closing statements now. And uh, before we do that, I want to thank Bill Thomas who has the thankless job of timekeeper right here. He, he volunteered for this, so I don't think he knew what he was in for. So a round of applause for Bill, please. And since the mayor went first uh, when we had opening statements, Councilman Brockhouse, I'll let you go first for well, closing that, I, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, and look, I, like I said at the beginning, it's a back and forth, and sometimes it's night and day. Uh, and people are going to do their best they can uh, to, to win a vote. And that's understandable. That's politics. It's unfortunate that it's gotten to where it is in our nation. But at the end of the day, we put the plan forward and we think this is what's best for San Antonio. And you voted. I mean, that, that, that's all the, the best scoreboard you could possibly have is the vote on May 4th. And at 701, if it's Ron or me, I'm fine either way. The truth of the matter is I'm a winner either way. Right? I either get to serve the city as the mayor or I get to go home to my family, my wife and kids. And I'll be just as blessed for that as well. I'm out to change San Antonio, sure. I only to make sure we're listening to the neighborhoods. I'm out to change City Hall. I don't think that they listen to the things that matter most to residents and community members. That's why property taxes are getting higher. They never change or lower. Crime's out of control. In some areas of our city, it's really dangerous to live and raise your family. It cannot be that way. And we've got to staff that department. The infrastructure needs, right? If you think about your community right here, I'll, I'll, you, you pay the most taxes in the city. You do, right? So we have to be careful as well that the things that matter most to you are funded and taken care of. Like you should have restroom facilities at Blossom Park, things that, the little basics that matter, right? Not porta potties, but things that matter to your neighborhood. You've got to build those things, the basic things that matter in neighborhoods, the congestion issues on Hardy Oak and Gold Canyon. We've got to answer the things. And it's different for every district. But the only way you know that is to go out there and be there, and, and not when it's just election time either. You can't just show up because now you want to vote. You've got to be there knocking the doors every day. And look, 
Ron and I disagree. And, but I want everybody in San Antonio to know this. And he'll never say this about me, but this is a good man. He's doing the best he can. And I don't know why he gets upset at everything that comes through just because I disagree with him. But the truth is he's doing the best he can. He's trying. I just see a different path for it. And I think we can do better going back to the neighborhoods. I've lived here my entire life. I know every corner of this city, and I'm prepared to lead it because I believe in it. And that's where we need to go. Ron, I continue to be thankful that you do stand here with me and we have the conversation. And you and I will shake hands. We'll go back to work on Wednesday and Thursday, and we'll be doing the best we can for San Antonio. Um, I will tell you that uh, I'm blessed to have my wife here this evening with me. Thank you for always standing by my side and being there for me. And this evening is no doubt no different than any other thing you've ever done and stood with me on. My kids who are watching at home, I'm thankful for them. The team that supports me at City Hall, I don't get to thank them enough. Uh, they're the real ones that do the work. I'm sure Ron would say the same thing, that our staffs are the ones that support us and carry us forward and do the great things. At the end of the day, though, I believe in our community. I think we need to fight for it. We need a leader who's from it, who gets it, who understands it, and who's going to go door to door, day to day, delivering on the things that matter most to you. Uh, no matter what happens on May 4th, I appreciate the time. I appreciate the conversation, and I look forward to earning your vote on Election Day. Thank you, Councilman. Mayor Nuremberg. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to everyone who showed up tonight, those of you who are watching, uh, for the opportunity to present uh, our choice or uh, present our case to you. And I think we presented a very clear choice, and that I'm the only proven leader on this stage who has a track record of getting things done uh, for you in this community and during my time as a city councilman and now as your mayor. We see that in the fact that the economy is booming and we're creating great paying jobs in all corners of the city. We see that in the fact that the crime rate is plummeting twice as fast as the national average. We see that in the fact that we are tackling the toughest challenges, transportation and so forth, head on. And I am the only candidate on this stage that has a clear and articulated vision for the future. That's Connect SA, the first ever and most innovative transportation plan the city has ever seen. That's also the Alamo Promise, which will offer tuition-free community college, two years, for every student who graduates from a Bear County high school who qualifies. And that is also our equity budgeting that is getting resources into desperately, ne desperately needed communities so that we're investing your city resources wisely. That's the choice here tonight. And I'm so glad to have the opportunity to talk with you. Our city has a $2.5 billion budget. We have 13,000 employees. We have a million and a half citizens who require and who depend on our community to work together to deliver essential services and quality of life. And so what is needed is thoughtful leadership, considerate, careful leadership, and visionary approaches to challenging issues. And that's what I offer, and that's why I'm asking for your vote. And I hope you'll agree. We need to continue to keep our economy growing with great paying jobs and targeted industries. We need to continue to stay vigilant on crime, and we need to continue to work together to forge ahead on innovative transportation solutions for our traffic problems. That's why I'm asking for your vote. I'm proud to serve you, and I hope to continue to serve you as your mayor and continue working hard every single day to create the city you deserve. Thank you. A round of applause for both candidates tonight. And before we, before we let you guys go, uh, Colleen from Northside Neighborhoods for Organized Development wanted to say a few things. Thanks to both of you gentlemen. We appreciate you coming tonight and presenting your opinions on these issues. Uh, please bear with us for just two more minutes. Um, we, um, I wanted to recognize there is another candidate here. He uh, probably got tied up in the traffic at Northwest Military and worse, Buck. <laughs> but Mr. Carlos Castu Castanuela, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, is here. Um, once again, we have we have nine. And Antonio Tony Diaz also yes. here. So thank you for being here. I'm sorry, Mr. Diaz. I did not. I'm sorry. I I do apologize. Once again, um, take a few minutes and speak to these people. If you see someone who is supporting Mr. Diaz or or Mr. Uh, Pena, I think his supporters are here, or take a minute to speak to Mr. Castanuela and get their view on a few things. Um, we do have to be out of here by nine, but um, that I did want to bring that up. Also, we have um, a, a, 
organization, a nonprofit organization called Mi Suidad Is Mi Casa, and I hope I didn't butcher that. <laughs> um, founded by Rich Acosta, um, he trains realtors to help individuals protest their property taxes. This is a free service. They'll do it throughout the city. Um, so if you have a question on that, Mr. Rich Acosta is over here. I also want to thank um, the Parks Department, uh, Mr. Grant Ellis and Kelsey Scherschel. I'm sorry if I messed up your name, <laughs> but um, th they are both here and the, the staff at the park really jumped through hoops. They had an event here today and that same event is going to be the next morning and it was the room was set up totally differently. So they really jumped through hoops to get this um, set up for us. Um, as our population grows, I hope that um, we recognize the need to ensure that all residents have easy access to parks and recreational activities. So keep that in mind next time there's a bond coming up and all because it is important to our quality of life. Thank you all for coming tonight. And I want to give my appreciation to the, I, I appreciate both of these candidates being here and all that Colleen has done, but I appreciate this audience being here as well and being so cooperative. So a round of applause for the many issues we got to. That's going to wrap it up for our live stream. For all of you at home, thank you for taking part in this participation and sending in your questions. And remember to vote on May 4th. Thank you.